Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, uh, it's a bittersweet day for me. It's always, even with my college students, it's always kind of with mixed emotion that I say goodbye. There's always some of my college students I'm really ready to say goodbye to. <laughs> but then there are, there are many, many others that I uh, will, will still think about and still remember with great fondness and wonder what they're doing. And so uh, it is with this class as well. Students are students no matter whether they're 18 year old or 90 years old. Uh, students still uh, uh, have many, many fine characteristics. And the one that I like to see in all my students is a great joy in uh, learning and uh, uh, an eagerness to learn. And I'm constantly right now with only, I only have three sessions left of my Vol State classes. Each of my classes only have three sessions left before final exams. And I tell my students on practically a daily basis, if I could just give you one thing from this class, it would be a sense of curiosity. And uh, that's what I think we're so in danger of losing here in this country. I think the sense of just being curious as to why that hill I drive by every day is called Signal Knob. Uh, and uh, it is because there's a steam, it used to be on a steamboat route, and the steamboats got the signal from the top of this small hill in Sumner County. And I, I really wish for you the very same thing, and I don't have to work very hard to give you all this desire because you, would, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't already been bitten by the bug to learn more. And so it's always a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I do feel very honored to have this opportunity and privilege to share with you some of the things I've learned. So today, if my computer ever comes up here on my side of the screen, <laughs> I'm going to kind of give you both a, a summary and a, um, a, a little new information too. I mean, uh, so we're going to talk kind of both ends of the spectrum here uh, from 1896 uh, to, the, to maybe 2000 and then before 1896 so that you have some sense of continuity when you walk out the door here and you have some takeaway from uh, what we have done in this class here. Uh, and it, it, as we move closer towards uh, the present day, you all see that uh, we are getting to elections in which we all remember quite well, a la 1960, which I am going to talk about today before we adjourn, because we remember who won and who lost, but some of the uh, little things that happened in between uh, we have forgotten about. Now, last week, I told you that the question I was answering most all of last week was, well, how does the Electoral College work? Now this week, it's a new question. People have been sending me emails, not so much from you guys, but from people I know. And the question is, okay, Carol, how many elections have we actually had in which the person who received the highest number of popular votes did not get elected president because of the electoral votes? And so I hope to touch on that today a little bit. So we'll see, uh, since I won't see you next week, I really won't know what the question everybody's going to be asking next week when I'm in line at the grocery store is. But I uh, uh, hope that I'll be able to see some of you in the line at the grocery store. You know, this crowd is kind of an interesting crowd. I mean, they're the people that I only see on Friday or Saturday night at the movies. We are people of regular habits. We go to the movie. There are some of you I see at the Vanderbilt basketball games. Uh, there are some of you that went to college with my husband and, and so no, no, knew him before I did. And uh, then the rest of you know, I know from an, another assortment of people. So it's really comforting to come in here and teach people half of the faces that I recognize from days past. And I got to say this now. I, this is at least the third class I have taught in this room over the past four years or so for Ollie. And today I went to the ladies' room as I arrived in a slightly different fashion. And in all of these many trips, six sessions per class, this is the first time 
that I have recognized that uh, there is a cafeteria right underneath you. <laughs> Because I've always gone a different way, and I looked in there, and I said, oh my gosh, a buffet. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe the buffet is what I really, really uh, uh, would like to have after class is over today. So the, the, it, it did not look like that. The food service at Baylor University did not look like that way back in 1968 when I started there. So uh, food services on college campuses have considerably improved, as have residential facilities and uh, other things such as, I mean, there was no such thing as a student's sports facility where everybody went and, and worked out. Working out was not... Uh, uh, a sophisticated thing to do uh, if you were a female especially and so it's interesting to kind of watch how all of these things have have uh, changed over the years uh, and since we're still working on the technology piece up here and I do have some maps that actually are pretty important I'm going to actually start with where I really intended to end uh, until we had this little technology glitch here that's about to be fixed uh, you know, I've been, I've been asked a lot this week about the election, and as I, I told you last week, because I teach these students who are at, economically at the bottom of the spectrum, I really wasn't so surprised, and these students last week were very euphoric, and uh, yesterday at Vol State, we had the first genuine protest that I can remember, Rick, with students who had homemade signs. And, I mean, granted, it was pathetic. You know, there weren't very many students, but they were having a protest march at our demonstration, I should say, at Vol State. And you'll never guess what they are, were protesting, or maybe you will, I don't know. These, we have on our campus these stickers, and if you're a faculty member like me, you can put one voluntarily on your door, you don't have, you're under no pressure to do it, that says safe space. And that means that if you are a student who feels threatened or intimidated, or if you've got any problems of a nature of you're gay and people in your class are making fun of gay people, or you're a Muslim and people are trying, constantly trying to get the, your your uh, ha, uh, uh, hijab caught in their book or something to try to pull the thing inadvertently, of course, off your head. You can come to these faculty members around campus and you will be safe there and we will do whatever appropriate action is. That is what they were protesting. They Now that the election is over, these students feel empowered to say we need to get rid of all these safe spaces, that we're, we're harboring homosexuals, bisexuals, transgender, we are harboring these people. Now folks, this is the real world I'm talking about. And the election is over, there's really nothing we are gonna do about it, but I do think it is up to us, if we hear of anything like this going on, we really need to let our senators and representatives know that this is going on. And if President-elect Trump has any hope of succeeding in this country, he has got to tame some of his supporters. I'm not saying all, but some of his supporters who see that his election means that now they can discriminate against anybody they please and all barriers are off as what to, to what they say to absolutely anybody. So that is the note on which I hoped to end this class, uh, but we will, uh, we're about to get the PowerPoint. Right, Rick. The silver lining from Ball State standpoint. What's that? Well, at least they know what the safe space thing is. When I was in, in my office had a window, by the way. They would bring students by for tours, and they would come to my office and point to that and say, this is where you go if there's a tornado. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm in a bunker. I'm in a bunker, so I don't have. I don't have. Uh, uh, you always go where there's a window. Yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah. I, I have no window, so it can be snowing, storming, or most anything out there, and I won't really know uh, what's going on out there in uh, the world beyond uh, my office. But, you know, yes. Is it part of the Constitution? Yes, it is certainly a part of the Constitution. Uh, it was uh, the Founding Fathers were fearful of the masses. They were very much afraid of people participating in government that too much, a dangerous mob, a rabble-rousing crowd. And so because they wanted only the elite of a society to uh, uh, be making the important decisions for our country, they called this process a college. And it was also giving the state legislature some power in the election of the president. And so as a result of this, uh, they really assumed the state legislatures were mostly going to be the ones nominating the electors. And then those elite people, the best and brightest, the, the most uh, 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 community-minded people, would be the ones who would choose the president. And uh, that is still the way it is. And you know, whatever party you're a member of, or, or we don't really sign up for parties here in Tennessee, uh, but whatever your a party you support, you love the Electoral College when your team wins and, and, and they didn't get the maximum, they didn't get, they didn't win the popular vote. Conversely, when your party loses, you hate the Electoral College and say it is not democratic at all. It is, um, uh, uh, needs to be abolished. And so you, you see that time and time again. And I think I may have mentioned at one point, Hank, I'm not sure, but I'll say this again if I, if, if, uh, if I did say it before. Uh, the Electoral College benefits small states. And going back to 1824 when Andrew Jackson, our own man, won the popular vote but lost, not in the electoral, he won the electoral vote that year, but he lost in the House of Representatives, which is a step three of the process. When that happened, uh, he was the one who said, we need to amend the Constitution to abolish every part of this, the Electoral College and the House of Representatives uh, making any part of the decision so that it is the will of the people. And by the time Andrew Jackson had become president, Andrew Jackson, uh, at, 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 this had already happened here in this country, uh, we had opened the franchise so that not only uh, did you uh, have more people voting, there were very few requirements for you to be registered to vote. And so fast forward to after the Civil War, and that's when the poll tax came into play. And I can, I've probably still got somewhere my mother's poll tax uh, receipt because she, she didn't have to show her driver's license, but she did have to uh, show her poll tax uh, receipt any time that she or my grandmother went to vote. Now let's see if this, this computer has a will of its own today. Um, all right. Now that you said that the electric also benefit rural over urban areas? Well, on, it's a state, it's a state <laughs> thing, you know. It really, I mean, it, you know, if Tennessee's votes were prorated, which Tennessee, any state in the union, any state can vote, the legislature can vote, and Governor Haslam signed it in January, that Tennessee's electoral vote, which is 11 votes, nine U.S. representatives, and um, two senators, if, if, if the legislature wanted to do that, 
they could do it and say, if you get 60% of the vote, you get 60% of the electoral uh, vote. And if you don't get 60% of the vote, uh, you don't uh, get 60 First, you get 40% of the electoral vote. But that would make a difference. Now I can't find the clicker. <laughs> All right. It, I, well, uh, the clicker's not here. No clicker. Okay. We will do, we will do, we will go forward here. So, I want to talk about a few of these elections. And here's the one I was talking about. Here you see Jackson winning the popular vote. He won the electoral vote, but you had this hodgepodge of candidates. So according to the Constitution, it went, the, the, uh, uh, it went to the House of Representatives because nobody had gotten 50% of the popular vote, uh, or of the electoral vote, excuse me. Now, we talked about all of these elections just very briefly leading up to uh, the very controversial election of 1876. And honestly, if you look back at all of these, this election probably was the very one that we really had the most potential for gun battles violence, for actual violence. Because there were these contested states, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, and the Republicans had decided that if they could claim those electors as votes for Rutherford B. Hayes, that Rutherford B. Hayes would go to the White House. The, elect, the, the popular vote in this election was very close, but Samuel Tilden won the popular vote, and then Hayes got just enough of those uh, uh, electoral votes to win the electoral college by one vote. Hank. I know, uh, population has shifted, hasn't it? Tennessee had 12 in 1876, and now we only have 11. So yeah, uh, there's been a lot of changes on this map, uh, and when you add all of those other states, it becomes even more significant there. So Hayes, Hayes uh, didn't get much done. Uh, just to, to refresh your memory, I really felt like once Hayes became president and the troops were removed out of the South, nobody really wanted government doing much. And we were seeing these men who understood the potential of our economic system here in the United States. And they understand how to use capital in larger ways, larger amounts that had ever been raised before. And this really was due to the coming together of the financing for the Transcontinental Railroad. And so these are the folks that seem to have the most power. These wealthy men who some books call, some textbooks refer to them as the organizers, they organize the economy. Uh, some refer to them as captains of industry. I think that's how they really like to be called. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Frick. I think they prefer to be called captains of industry. And then some people, like historian Howard Zinn, just flat out called them robber barons. Now, if you don't know the work of Howard Zinn, and I should have put him on my bibliography. This is why I get always nervous about these bibliographies. Thank you. Uh, because uh, uh, once I do it, I always remember five books that I should have put on there. But some of you will like Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, and some of you will find it offensive. Howard Zinn taught at Boston University for many years. He only died five or six years ago. Uh, he was very controversial. He was a, a, an avowed member of the Communist Party. Uh, he uh, is, it's, it's history taught from the bottom up, so it's very pro-labor, very pro-farmer, very anti-elite, but it is provocative. And, you know, I always think that if anybody can read Howard Zinn and not find his point of view, uh, they haven't read it very carefully because it is such an incredibly provocative book. As a matter of fact, 
uh, a sociology professor here at Vanderbilt uh, has been working for about three years with some of his students on a similar project, a people's history of Nashville, which is coming out next year, uh, that will be patterned on Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, and it will uh, focus on people in, at the bottom of the social ladder in Nashville who uh, organized into labor unions, into various organizations to end discrimination. So that's, I've, I've actually, I'm proofreading the draft, uh, and I will do that next week when I'm not with you all. So I'll, I'll be working on that. Uh, no, that's Thanksgiving. I won't be working on that on Thanksgiving. I'll be, I'll be uh, eating with my grandchildren on Thanksgiving Day, eating, eating turkey, I hope. So um, this election was quite the norm, it turned out, not so much from the point of view of controversy, but from the point of view of the closeness of the numbers of the popular vote. So here we have 1876, Hayes didn't like being president, he was ready to go back uh, home and uh, he, he, we're going to have another contested election. The Republicans have a very strong candidate, James Garfield. Uh, the Democrats uh, nominate, uh, and I'm going to blank on Hancock's name here for just a minute, but they nominate a, an equally strong candidate. And as you see, look at the popular vote there, how close those two numbers are, 4,454,000 uh, for Garfield. 4,444,000 for Hancock. And so we see up until 1896, which people predicted was going to be incredibly close, and it turned out not to be, uh, but you see the, the elections are very divided. And so James Garfield, we really never knew what kind of a president he was going to be because he got shot by an anarchist uh, within the first few months he was president, he lingered for a few months in the summer and he really died because of the treatment that the doctors were pursuing trying to find this bullet in his abdomen. And um, he died and the person they had put on the ticket, Chester A. Arthur, to balance the ticket, Chester A. Arthur, a friend of Tammany Hall and Roscoe Conklin versus a reform-minded uh, James Garfield, it is Arthur that becomes president, and the irony of this, which is so often the case in American political history, he was the one that ended up passing, succeeded in passing civil service reform and the creation of the Civil Service Commission. And that was a big thing. That was where all the patronage jobs were. And believe me, there's plenty of patronage jobs in government right now. So it's just a fact that, that you reward your friends with jobs. And today it seems like you reward your friends with jobs, but mostly it's not your friends that you're taking care of. It's can you find a job for my son? He graduated from Harvard with a degree in art history. And he's... <laughs> now, you know who made so much fun of art history? I am not original the car talk guys. And so I, they were always making fun of people who had degrees in art history. So that's why I have to make that little quip about having a degree in art history. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, these sons and daughters of large country contributors, whether it's a Democratic president or a Republican president, they are often the beneficiaries of many patronage jobs today. So Chester A. Arthur, yes, did somebody have a question? No, okay. So Chester A. Arthur uh, serves out Garfield's term, which is practically his own, t his whole term. And then in 1884, here comes James G. Blaine again, uh, the, the half-breed that had criticized uh, President Grant so heavily. He is going to get the Republican nominee at Nation, and Grover Cleveland will get the Democratic nomination. 
And this election is also quite close. You look at the difference in the popular vote there, and Cleveland barely squeaked out just a hair's worth there of votes, less than 50,000, but he did win the electoral vote. Now, here is another one of these elections coming up, 1888, when a candidate receives most of the popular vote and still loses the electoral college. I wouldn't say most, but more, more, than, more than the opponent. And this is the election of 1888, in which Grover Cleveland is challenged by Benjamin Harrison, grandson of former president uh, William Henry Harrison. And so this election is so incredibly close here. And as you see here, by 100,000 votes, uh, Cleveland won, but Harrison won the electoral vote. And it was, it was, nobody remembers this one because it was just kind of boring. I mean, you know, you don't know much about either one of these guys. And really, they didn't do a whole lot in office. The two big issues throughout this whole period, the Gilded Age, are the tariff, should we have one or not, should it be to generate money or should it be to protect industries in the United States? Uh, and then the other one, was uh, the gold standard. Should we be on the gold standard? Should our money be backed by gold? Should it be inflated with just printed greenbacks? Or should it be backed by maybe two metals, gold and silver, or maybe some other precious metals? So needless to say, the farmers were all about getting us off of the gold standard. Yes? Mm -hmm. So is that possible back then, question one, and right now, what percentage of the states actually have proportional representation? Uh, that's a good question. What percentage of the states have proportional representation in the Electoral College? I have been really trying to find a, a map of what happened last week, and even the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, they don't have really quite a definitive map of what happened last week. But the last election, I think there were two states Nebraska. that, what? Nebraska and Maine. Nebraska and Maine. You're talking about districts. Uh, they, yeah, but it's district, but it's proportional. In other words, you know, if, six, if you've got six Democratic congressmen, they're going to vote for the Democratic electors, and the, it's the congressional districts or the districts for those states. Well, yeah, but it's, 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 the, it's the number of representatives you have in. And so like Tennessee, what was the vote? 60% to less than 40% here in Tennessee. And we only have two Democratic Senate, uh, representatives right now, which are Jim Cooper and uh, uh, Representative Cohen from Memphis. And the other seven are Republicans right now. Yes, Hank. Is that right? That's interesting. Well, that I, I had not even really considered that, and of course, when I go vote, Hank, you know, I can't take a picture of myself and my vote. <laughs> so I don't have a selfie to 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 remind myself of what the ballot looked like after I had cast my vote. But yeah, you have some choices there, and, and the other side of that issue is you cannot run for president. I mean, I can't write in Hank Davis if you don't already have some electors lined up that'll be on the ballot, because me writing in your vote, your name, means I'm not going to, uh, my vote's not going to count unless you've gotten yourself registered for president and you're on, on the ballot, so to speak. Delilah. Well, that 
that's what a lot of talk is about today. Uh, as a matter of fact, and the word on the street uh, is that um, there, there are some electors in Nevada that may, that were elected as Trump electors, but they may change their mind. And, 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 and this is my take on that. This is just talk. I'm, I'm right there with President Obama. Uh, Donald Trump has been elected, and you know, chasing these moon moonbeams may be interesting stories when you have a a 24-hour news channel that you have to fill 24 hours a day. But I really don't think I don't think that's going to happen. I, I don't think the electors are going. I don't think the electoral vote is going to to flip here. But you know, the amazing thing about the popular vote. From, from last week is that the more they count these popular votes, the Clinton margin gets bigger and bigger. And as of last night, it was almost right at 2 million votes. So again, you see the power of the Electoral College here and why I don't really think we'll get rid of it. But there's all manner of stuff you can find out there on the internet about all of these many, many subjects. So, Benjamin Harrison was a businessman's president. And so his big thing he inherited, imagine this, he inherited a surplus in the budget. Now, you know, this is 20-something years after the Civil War and we've now got a surplus in our federal budget. So, Harrison, listening to people like uh, some very famous uh, naval historians and others said what the United States needs to spend its surplus money on is building a modern navy. Now, I wonder where uh, this Mr. May Mahan, the naval historian who, who was preaching this, we need a modern navy, I wonder where he could have gotten that idea. <laughs> Who was building a big, big navy already? Great Britain and Germany. They were building up their navies, and so, you know, the British had this huge empire, which the British had had since before the Civil War. And the Germans want, the Kaiser wants to compete with the British, and so the Kaiser is working on building up his navy at this very same time. And the likes of Teddy Roosevelt, a young man who will become Assistant Secretary of the Navy here before the century is out, he is very much a supporter of building a big navy. Now, what is the idea behind us having a big navy? We had had this economic recession in 1873. We're going to have another one in 1893. Here is Benjamin Harrison, who is right before this next storm, and he'll be out of office, not by choice, but by the voters, before the next panic of 1893 occurs. But what folks were looking at is how efficient and how productive our capital system, raising capital to fund investments in factories, is, is working. And our factories are working with such great efficiency that the factories are now producing more than we as American consumers can consume. They are producing more than we are buying. And so, Already, uh, you know, 12 years before we turn the century into 1900, you've got many people who are looking long term at the productivity of the United States factories and our economic system, and they're saying, well, we're going to have to find some markets for these surplus goods that we're producing. Our agriculture is producing more wheat, more cotton, all of these things than we are able to consume. So we need to find some overseas markets. 
And it's no coincidence that right during this period, as we for the first time are really as a nation toying with the idea of imperialism, owning colonies, except we've never used that word colonies for any <laughs> land. We call it territories. Territories sound so much nicer than colony. And so we, we're toying with colony, t colonies, but we're calling them territories. So isn't it amazing that when Queen Lily Ukulani gets elected to be the leader of Hawaii, and she kind of looks at these American companies that are making a lot of money uh, on pineapple and other products, that uh, she decides she's going to restrict foreign investments in her islands. And the next thing you know, Hawaii is a United States territory. Now, the people of Hawaii voted for this, so I don't want to imply that we just went over there and took it. But the, the fact of the matter is, in the 1820s and 30s, missionaries from the northeastern states were going all the way around the Horn of South America to witness to these Hawaiians. And uh, their, their sons and grandsons and great-grandsons stayed there. And uh, uh, they, were, they didn't stay as missionaries. They invested in the land and they put people to work. So you have Chinese laborers coming in because of jobs. You have Japanese laborers coming in. Uh, there's a lot of those, those people, who the Chinese and Japanese, along with the native Hawaiians, the Polynesians, uh, and they, they are, are all there, but with the kind of the top tier of society are the descendants of these American missionaries that had come before the Civil War there. Now, Rick Rao up here will know where I learned all of this, and I learned this, and it stuck with me all of this time since uh, 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 1969 or 70 when I read this book in, uh, as a college student. And Rick makes fun of these books because they begin each one with the dinosaurs. <laughs> James Mishner's Hawaii. And, you know, I, I guess I'm just getting to be an old fogey. I still love all of Mishner's work. You know, if you've read um, the book about the woman who walks the Pacific Crest Trail, what's the name of the book? Wild, wild, wild. wild, wild. Uh, you know, she made fun of her mother for reading and loving James Mishner. Well, I thought, well, gee. That's not such a bad thing, uh, because I, I adored reading those books. And although uh, I do understand that they're all fiction, I mean, his facts are remarkably accurate. And if you want to understand Hawaii's history, no better, no better book to read than to read James Mishner's Hawaii. The same is true of his book, Poland. It's a very powerful book. So we're interested in becoming, we are very interested in becoming a nation with a global reach. How we accomplish that is up for grabs, but the first thing we've got to do is have naval vessels that are appropriate to defend our ships and our shipping as they go across the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean. But we're mostly looking at the Pacific area as investment opportunity. All right, so Benjamin Harrison is president. We build up the Navy. He spends the deficit. And we have round two, same candidates, uh, a slightly uh, different scenario here. But this time, Grover Cleveland squeaked out the victory. So we have Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland. And Cleveland has the great misfortune of being president when this panic occurs and there are railroad strikes and all sorts of other things going on. And so Cleveland uh, is left holding the bag here with this. And I'm sure Harrison was quite happy to be out of the picture. Now, if you take your computer and look at some of these 
see that white or the, the, the area where it says minor candidates there? You've got the big, the big minor party, third party candidate, uh, pop party is the populist party. And this is kind of its zenith. It is going to collapse here in the next election, and uh, they never are able to quite do what they had hoped to do, which is to bring uh, uh, farmers and factory workers together in one party, the People's Party. And so uh, Weaver, who they nominated, James B. Weaver, he uh, gets their nomination. He gets this 9% chunk of the popular vote, but, uh, but, and he actually gets 22 electoral votes here, but Cleveland is elected and he has to deal with the after effects of the, uh, the uh, depression. And as a result of all of this, one thing that happens is the Pullman workers at the Pullman factory in Illinois decide that they are going to strike, but they have a, 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 a new person on the scene, a young, very charismatic man who really believes in the power of organized labor. And so he convinces these workers at the Pullman uh, area that it, it's got to be more widespread than just these workers at the Pullman plant. And so as a result, Eugene Debs is able to effectively uh, uh, bring together railroad workers who work on the trains that pull the Pullman cars together, and they have this strike, and Grover Cleveland is very upset, and he brings in troops to put down the strike. On what grounds can Grover Cleveland bring in uh, uh, troops to put down a labor strike. National security. What is carried on these trains? Not guns and weapons, the mail. And it is impeding the, the carriage of the mail, and so uh, there is a, a, a set of violence there. Now what this strike does is to put Eugene Debs on the, screen, on the screen, and he is going to be a force to be reckoned with. Uh, there's a fairly new biography of him out, which is not on my bibliography. I just thought about it just this minute, so you'll just have to go onto Amazon and check it out. I use Amazon as my library, too. I look it up, and then I see if it's at the public library when I get the author and the name straight. So uh, anyway, then I go to the library and check out the book. Uh, so uh, Debs is going to run for president five times more times than our friend William Jennings Bryan. All right, 1880, 18, 1896 is a pivotal year because whoever is elected in 1896 is going to lead this country into the 20th century. Yes? Okay, before you leave 1892, it appears that there are some states up there where the votes were proportional. Yes, that's right. There, and there's one, one of these maps has a, a, a proportional in Tennessee, too. There's one of them that Tennessee was proportional here. So you've got Oregon, California, I don't know what Right. And you know, yeah, because the state legislature decided to do that. Yeah, the next election, I think. But yeah, they changed. And you know, everybody really thought in 2000 until we, when we were uh, blissfully unaware of what a hanging chad was, we all thought that Colorado, there was a referendum on the Colorado ballot in November of 2000 for Colorado's electoral votes to be distributed uh, proportionally or by the congressional, di the congressional districts, which I use those terms uh, one and the same. Uh, but, but Colorado voted not to divide up their electoral votes. And you know, people thought Colorado was probably the best chance, and so I think it's gonna be really hard to ever get the other states to go along with it since Colorado 
uh, didn't have any success with it. And, but it could happen. See, Colorado chose to put it on the ballot. Uh, we in Tennessee uh, would not have to have a referendum. Yes, our legislature often asks for a referendum, but that is rarely ever constitutionally required. So, yeah, yeah, Hank? Right. And Chesapeake. It, Chesapeake is about the, the founding of this country, and both of those books, and, and you know, the centennial really is it, funny. They do start with the, di all of them start with the dinosaurs. And so uh, you know what was going on there, but they're, they're, both of those are really, really good books. Uh, and uh, I, I, I thought, you know, you should start at your, I'm at the point of life where I have no plans to move, but I'm trying to winnow down some of my stuff because uh, my husband has announced that we are not building more bookshelves at our house yeah. and um, that it is now time for me, not him of course, uh, but me to dispose of some of those books that I've been hanging on to. But those missioner books, they will go with me to the nursing home. Uh, they will, they will, they're, you know, they're just, I, I may be shrinking my books, but missioner will undoubtedly be, be my comfort when I'm in a nursing home. So we have all these third parties appearing on the scene in and out here, but none of them really make much of a splash in the pan except for the populist. So, with 1896, we are at a turning point in American history. And the political, the dominant political parties, uh, by no means all of the parties, but they are looking to a candidate that will garner a lot of votes, that will have a vision that they can project. So the Republicans in 1896 uh, nominate William McKinley. He is a strong candidate. He has Civil War experience. He's an Ohio boy, raised in Ohio. You know, one of those almost Horatio Alger success stories. His family was poor. He got a year of college and then he had to drop out, but he enlisted in the Union Army. He was an assistant to the quartermaster at Antietam. Any of y'all ever been to the Antietam battlefield? There is a big monument, uh, a memorial to William McKinley there, not for anything he did leading troops into battle, but he in the heat of this battle, the bloodiest day in American history, William McKinley and his job as assistant to the quartermaster went through the line of fire to carry coffee to the men on the front line of the Union Army. So he comes back to Ohio, he gets involved in community affairs, he marries, and he holds a variety of political offices moving up the political ladder. And so there were other Republicans who really did want the nomination, but he won the nomination fairly easily. There was little, he, he won it without too much ado uh, in the, the Republican National Convention, their summer convention in the summer of 1896. Now the Democrats had a whole host of people on their list of who were possible candidates for president in 1896. Most of these people, again, were people who had a career and an established record in holding elected office. And so they, their convention is a little more raucous affair. And there's a great deal of disparity within the ranks of the Democrats in 1896 because that party themselves is very divided on the issue of the gold standard, the bimetal standard, and, and Grover Cleveland himself had, had, bit, had, after the panic said, he supported the gold standard, which made a good part of the Democratic Party very angry with him. So the Democratic Party, it's really kind of up for grabs who they are going to nominate 
for president. And of course, one thing you need if you're going to have a political convention, you really need some fiery speakers. So even though this young congressman has uh, been a very important, uh, successful public speaker, he doesn't really have a lot of support within the party because he has been so openly critical of the Democratic Party's own president, Grover Cleveland. So his name is mentioned, but he's really looked at as just a little too radical for the Democrats. Well, amazingly, he gets the nomination. William Jennings Bryan. Now, his, his trajectory is very similar to that of William McKinley. However, he was only five years old when the Civil War broke out, so William Jennings Bryan had no Civil War record that he could tout and talk about. He uh, had been all through his growing up and his political career, he had been always known as a brilliant public speaker. So his speaking ability had gotten him to college. He graduated from college, unlike McKinley, but they, he had been to college. He had considered a, 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 a going and becoming a minister. He, did, he did ultimately decided not to do that. He actually, he went to law school before law schools were required to get a law degree and he became a lawyer, and his one thing, they might not remember anything else about him, I mean, he didn't have any really good cases to try in the beginning, but they remembered him being such a brilliant public speaker. So his political career uh, got sort of stalled, and he decided he would move with his wife to the state of Nebraska, where the state of Nebraska, <clears throat> largely a farm state, embraced him and he was elected to Congress and he was very, very popular as a politician in the state of Nebraska. So he is at this Democratic National Convention. He is a Democrat even though he criticizes the President of the United States. He's had very thin margins when he has been uh, elected and re-elected to Congress, but still he has a very good track record. So he had two objectives that he wanted to accomplish when he was out there in Nebraska. He wanted to take control of the Democratic Party in Nebraska and he wanted, he deliberately wanted to win a national following. And so the way that he did this was hitting the road and talking about the issues. And you know, it's always easier if you're going to be a public speaker to draw crowds if you're criticizing whatever party is in power. And now that we've got 24-hour news, if you expect to be covered at all, you're going to have to get out there and say some things that are really uh, over the top, as it were. Just ask Jeb Bush about that. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> I have to tell you all when to laugh here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, you know, Jeb Bush, uh, I mean, I think he played it too safe. And, and he was, he was giving talks, but they weren't so fiery and emotional, which is there are similarities here between how Brian got the Democratic nomination. His positions were always predictable, but as you see in the 1896 election, he was kind of Johnny One Note. He knew one song to sing, he sang it well, but people get tired of hearing his song and his uh, theme of we've got to do something here. The tariff is not just economically misguided, it is morally wrong. And this is what Brian did with such effectiveness. He appealed to people's morality. It is, morali it is morally wrong for rich people to get benefit from this high protective tariff that is not helping the farmers, it is not helping the workers. 
So he goes to the convention, he gets the nomination, and then he gives the speech of his life. He gives a speech in which he, with great emotion and great drama, is now known forever as the Cross of Gold speech. And it's about both the tariff and the gold standard. His speeches are really filled with religious imagery. Uh, this particular speech, he says, You shall not bear down on mankind a crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. And you can hear him give this speech if you've got a computer. Don't do it in class here. To wait till you get home. Uh, uh, you all don't do that. I'm just making another little humor here. All right, forget about that. Uh, you can go into YouTube and and just put in the search engine "Cross of Gold" speech. You don't have a recording of that day in the summer of 1896, but you do have him in 1921 when the recording equipment was much better giving the cross of gold speech. And so you hear him and, and he, uh, he is a very energetic, high energetic, uh, e efficient campaigner. But that's all he's got. The Democrats don't really have the money to run what is gonna become a modern campaign. And what did William McKinley have? He had a behind the scenes person who ran his campaign, Mark Hanna, a very active politician who had been a US senator who raises the money. Mark Hanna sends out the, the, the campaigners to campaign for William McKinley while he sits on his front porch in Canton, Ohio and greets the citizenry as they come to pay their respects to him. And so here is Brian, he doesn't have much money, he gets on the train and campaigns all over the country, but he's, it's the same old speech whether it is in Colorado or Nevada or California, it is the same old speech. Now, Brian felt that he could pull it off because he was so much in sync with philosophically with what this populist party had been trying to do, bring organized labor or disorganized and uh, farmers into one umbrella the populists turned around since they didn't have anybody to nominate and they couldn't agree. They turned around and nominated Bryan as the populist nominee for president, which was the Democratic nominee. So that was pretty much the end of the populist party. But Bryan thought that he could carry these rural parts of the country, uh, which he was not successful in doing. Uh, McKinley's people were able to raise enough money to print lots and lots of literature and he sat on his front porch and he rather handily won the election by the biggest margin that we had really seen in several elections. Look at the popular vote. He defeated Brian by about 600,000 votes and then he got a whopping amount of the electoral vote. So what this election really, I think, really represented more than anything else was do you want to be that nation that Thomas Jefferson talked about, a nation of farmers working the land, or do you want to be an industrial world power? And the voters, by voting for William McKinley, said, we want this country to be an industrial world power. A, we want jobs in cities. This is what we want, and we are voting for William McKinley. So William McKinley uh, is under a lot of pressure when he takes over the helm of the executive branch of our government. and. Uh, he uh, uh, is, is in the White House, and the newspapers, which are competing with each other like crazy, you've got the Hearst papers, 
competing with the Joseph Pulitzer Papers, and they have found a way to sell papers. We can now print newspapers very, very cheaply in 1897 and 1898, and so the way that we sell papers is to put something great on the headlines of the paper that will make people want to pay the nickel for the newspaper. And so the, the place where they find their stories is down in Cuba. Amazingly, in 1897 and 98, Cuba is still a colony of Spain. Spain has held on to Cuba. And there's a lot of criticism that makes the front page of a lot of American newspapers about how the Spaniards who own the land are treating the native Cubans who are the workers primarily in their sugarcane fields. And so there is a lot of criticism in this. The newspapers just ratchet up the stories to the level of intensity that they can be ratcheted up. Um, uh, the artist, uh, Frederick Remington, is a newspaper artist working for one of these papers, and uh, it, he, he is alleged to have told them, you know, uh, if I, can, I can get you a war. If that's what you want, I can get the pictures for you. So we have, um, our Navy is big, remember that. We have uh, battleships in the Caribbean, we have a Pacific fleet over in the Pacific now that we have a territory, Hawaii, and we're looking at those islands in between Hawaii and the coast of, of uh, Asia there, the eastern coast of Asia, particularly Southeast Asia in particular. We're looking in that direction, so we have a large Pacific fleet in the Pacific Ocean as well. So when a United States battleship, the USS Maine, explodes in 1898 in the harbor of Havana, that raise any questions? <laughs> Why was there a battleship in Havana's harbor? Uh, uh, it blows up under very mysterious circumstances. There have been lots and lots of books written about this, what really happened to the Maine. But President McKinley goes to Congress and gets a declaration of war against Spain. Now, this is, is a war that really, for all practical purposes, at least in Cuba, only la lasted about four months. But what are we doing? We are trying to liberate the Cuban people from their imperial uh, country, mother country, Spain. That is what our objective is. Meanwhile, it's amazing how fast the Pacific Fleet, led by Admiral Dewey, finds itself in Manila Bay in the Philippines. And so as a result of this, uh, uh, Dewey is able to march in, land, overthrow the Spanish authorities in the Philippines. So we are going to defeat Spain on both sides of this spectrum in this war very quickly. Well, there were, there were local Filipinos who rejoiced because they wanted to be independent themselves and they wanted to throw off the shackles of being a Spanish colony. Well, this gets very ugly in United States Congress and among a, a variety of people. What are we doing here? So, we, 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 Cuba wins its independence, although Congress passes a bill saying that we have the right, two things, one, to have a naval base on the island of Cuba, a la Guantanamo Bay, and then the other thing is that we write into this is another uh, uh, amendment to their constitution, Cuba's, that the United States has a right to question anything in their constitution. In other words, we're making you independent, but we're giving ourselves a little control. Now, over in the Philippines, we don't make any pretense 
of, of that, of giving the Filipinos their independence. It looks like a great stepping stone. California, Hawaii, the Philippines, Southeast Asia, into the continent. And so uh, in the Philippines, we, we get out of the war in Spain, in, four, in Cuba, in four months. In the Philippines, after Spain has declared them to be independent, we wage war with the native Filipinos. Emilio Aguinaldo was the leader of this resistance for four years. And more Americans died over there in the Philippines than died in, in, in Cuba for sure. It was, as Teddy Roosevelt himself said, a splendid little war. But, you know, the, in the Philippines, there were, uh, the longer you're there, the more diseased people are going to catch. And these Filipinos wanted to be independent before we put Emilio Aguinaldo down. And it became a territory of the United States. And William Howard Taft will be sent to, Cuba, uh, to the Philippines as a territorial governor. That's where he kind of gets on the map. So we, as we approach the 20th century, are becoming a global power. And there are some people in this country who are very critical of the taking of the Philippines. Andrew Carnegie offered to give the government money to buy the Philippines from the American government and give them their freedom, and Congress and the President did not choose to take Carnegie up on that. So we've got Carnegie, an unlikely person, leading what looks like kind of an anti-business uh, 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 faction here. Carnegie joins up with Mark Twain and labor leaders in this anti-imperialism movement, we don't need to be doing this. And they're not successful, but they at least tickle the conscience of lots and lots of Americans. So McKinley is reelected in 1900. He puts on his ticket this time as his running mate, uh, this man who really knows how to get publicity. Theodore Roosevelt, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, the great uh, run up San Juan Hill, at least that's how he told the story, so that's how it got reported, and he becomes the Vice President. Well, the, uh, McKinley is shot by an anarchist. He was one of about six heads of state during that period from about 1890 to the beginning of World War I with the shooting of the Archduke of Austria. Six heads of state had been killed, one of which was our president by anarchists who wanted to overthrow government. The other five were in Europe. Uh, but uh, William McKinley is shot and Theodore Roosevelt becomes president. Now, let's look at these elections. 1900, guess who runs again? Don't run for president twice. If you lose the first time, it's not going to work out. So, you know, we, we see Adlai Stevenson had this problem, too. He ran twice against Eisenhower. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was so popular by 1904 that even Bryan says, I'm not running against him. So the Democrats nominate Alden Parker. Any of you know anything about him? I didn't think so. All right. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt uh, comes along in... Uh, 1908, and he shocks everybody because he had loved being president. I mean, he loved it. And he announces he's not going to run again. It's time for his hand-picked successor, William Howard Taft, to take his place. So Taft runs. Well, Brian, hey, hey, maybe I can run again. So William Jennings Bryan runs against Taft, and the minor candidates there are Eugene Debs and a host of others as well there on that map. So uh, Taft becomes president. He is uh, much calmer than President Theodore Roosevelt. The business community likes Taft much better than they liked 
Roosevelt, and Roosevelt wasn't counting on his, in his retirement, getting bored. So Roosevelt goes to the Republican convention in 1912 and says, boys, I'm back and I want to be president. <laughs> well, the man you picked four years ago is our president. We can't just dump him because you've decided you want to come back. And so as only you can imagine the drama of this, as only Theodore Roosevelt, who, you know, had some, some leg problems because he had been sick as a child, he storms out of there. He's short and muscular. He storms out of there. The reporters say he stormed out like a bull moose. <laughs> so he joins with Jane Addams and some others, and they form the Progressive Party, known as the nickname the Bull Moose Party. And Teddy Roosevelt runs against his hand-picked man. So the Democrats don't really have a strong candidate, and they nominate Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, as I, I probably mentioned the first or second day of class, he is in that category with James K. Polk that historians are re-evaluating his presidency. He was a very moral man. He had been president of Princeton. He had been governor. He was governor of New Jersey. And he feels that God tells him everything to do. So he is, is definitely uh, a, a very religious man, a very devoutly religious man. And he wouldn't have won this election. Look at the math. Look at the number of, of the votes here. Uh, let me get to 1912. There we go. Look at the votes here. Uh, he got 42% of the popular vote with uh, uh, 6 million of the pop plus of the popular vote. If you add together the popular vote that Taft and Roosevelt got combined, they would have won the popular vote and there would be lots of red states on the map. The only reason that Taft carried, uh, uh, that Taft did not get the nomination in these states, uh, the electoral votes, I guess I should say, the reason Taft didn't get the electoral votes was because he had to divide them, his vote with Roosevelt, and that allowed Woodrow Wilson to be elected president. So Woodrow Wilson felt that this was a sign from God that he should be president. On my list is a biography of him that came out three or four years ago by Scott Berg. I read it. It is an excellent book. I highly recommend it, especially all of you Presbyterians here, because it has a lot of things about the Presbyterian Church. His father was actually the president of the Presbyterian College in Middle Tennessee, Southwestern, which was in Clarksville. His father was here and his brother was the editor of the National Banner for a while. So Woodrow Wilson has Tennessee ties. But Wilson became president. Uh, the Europe uh, burst forth in World War I and a uh, World War I breaks out in Europe and Wilson is, he is trying to keep the United States out of the war. So when we do enter the war in 1917, it can't be that we don't like Germany and Austria. We have got to have a higher reason. So this war, the War of 1812, becomes uh, the War of 1812, World War I. I'm talking too fast because I see the clock ticking away. Uh, when we enter World War I, for Woodrow Wilson, it is the war to end all wars. It is going to make the world safe for democracy and to make sure that we never have another war. He will propose a worldwide peacekeeping organization, the League of Nations. That turned out to be Woodrow Wilson's downfall. He did get elected in 1916 before the United States entered the war on the platform of he kept us out of war. And then about a month after he took uh, the oath of office for the second time, we declared war on Germany and Austria and entered World War 
two, World War One. That election in uh, 1916, there's how many times Eugene Debs ran for president. The election in 1916 was really another one of these incredibly close votes, uh, and he defeated the Republican candidate, but just barely. And you see that group of minority votes, that was Debs and, and some others there on the list. So when Woodrow Wilson, the United States never joined the, the League of Nations. Hank. They have, they have electors, they have some, and even Washington, D.C. has an elector now, I think. I think. We've made some amendments to the Constitution. But we don't have some, I mean, Puerto Rico, people, some people think Puerto Rico ought to become a state. I think it's kind of a political football down there. Now, we are out of time, but I'm going to give you a, some homework. <laughs> Since all of you, everybody in this room remembers the election of 1960. I want you to go onto your computer and read about the charges of voter fraud that not Nixon, but the Republican Party brought against Kennedy after Nixon had conceded and very graciously to Kennedy. There was a story about this in uh, like maybe October 21st or 2nd in the New York Times, and you can find it on their website. But what it was doing, the headlines of this story say, uh, Trump should take a page of graciousness in concession like, like, ha, 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 like Richard Nixon did. And it goes on to talk about this fight over voter fraud, and I think you will all find it very interesting because... Fast forward, the election took place, Trump won, and one day this week, or maybe Friday or Saturday of last week, you know, they were, the, new, the Wall Street Journal was comparing President-elect Trump to President Nixon. So there's, you know, it's all of these comparisons coming up, and I really want to say I've enjoyed t having this class. The great pleasure of doing this is all mine. I, I love the prep. Uh, you all are always so gracious. Uh, and I hope that you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And, I, you know, there's a note on my bibliography. If you didn't get one, there's some laying on the table out there. I'll talk to anybody on the phone, but just don't ask me to call you back because I have so many calls that I have to return. But you feel free to call me or email me anytime you want to. Oh, wait just a second.